So, Future Connected. Let's talk about that. And in doing so, I'm not going to do a formal review or anything. I'm just going to kind of bounce around between topics. So, spoiler warning for all of that now, as well as all of the rest of the Xenoblade franchise, because there are things that need to be said about all of it. Firstly, I'm really glad that there is actually a spoiler warning if you try to go to the extra story tab on the main menu before you've beaten the main game once. So, I thought it was bad, and I had to make a PSA that ended up being misguided about not playing Future Connected first, because I thought people would think, oh, it's connected, so if I like two, there might be two connections in that, and that might backwardsly allow me to understand things, but then it opens up with finishing the final boss of the main game. Thankfully, it just straight up says, hey, guess what? This will spoil the hell out of the main game before you even get to Future Connected. You have to say, yes, I understand that in order to even access FC if you haven't finished the main game at least once on that user, I think. So, that's nice and all. And it seems like I was wrong in my preemptive speculation things. The one year later is one year following the absolute ending cutscene of the game, so Fiora coming back and all that. It's a year after that, which was six months after the end of the game, which means that Shulk is 19 to 20 now, and Melia would be somewhere around 89 or 90, depending on how far through their 18th and 88th years they were when the main game ended, because it's 18 months after that, so if they were past six months after their birthday, then they would be the higher number. Not really important, just, hey, that's how much more mature you'd expect the characters to be. Except, Melia ages, like, roughly a fifth the speed of a Homs, so she hadn't changed at all. But, again, she was already one of the more mature and learned characters in the party. And, honestly, neither her nor Shulk seem to have changed a whole lot. They're roughly right where they were at the end of the main game, which is fine. It was 18 months after that, but... Also, they've been relatively in peace and just kind of rebuilding the entire time, so they hadn't been through any massive trials or great things that would shake up their opinions, their personalities, and how they view the world, and that's fine. And then there's the thing that, it's called Future Connected, and when you hear Connected in a Xeno title, you'd think that that would talk about how connected it is to the other Xeno titles. And the big takeaway about FC is that it's very, very, very much more the epilogue to Xenoblade 1 it's advertised as than anything warranting having connected in the title. Post-release information has sort of clarified that the title is more referring to the future of the High Entia and Melia connecting with her people as their new leader. That makes more sense. But... You don't put Connected in the title of a Xeno game without expecting there to be some sort of Zohar space-time continuum shenaniganery. So, I feel like the name alone is what caused disappointment for a lot of people in this. If it was called something more like Xenoblade Chronicles, Future of the High Entia, Future in the Clouds, something connected to Future on- Wings of the Future. That- I like that. It should have been called Wings of the Future. That would have been fine. It just... If the title didn't imply any sort of connection to other Xeno games, I think a lot less people would be disappointed. As is, though, I enjoyed it a whole lot. It's still Xenoblade. It's still Xenoblade 1. Again, 1 isn't necessarily my favorite game to play, but it's still my favorite series, so I'm not going to complain about more of that. It's more time hanging out with Shulk and Melee, who are probably my two favorite party members from the original game. You get a ton of expansion on Tyrea, who is actually one of my favorite characters in general now after this. And then the new characters that were added, Kino and Nene, are actually fantastic. They're probably my favorite Nopon, and in them existing and a lot of their interactions, they honestly made me retroactively like Ricky even more. We hear that he's a good father, and that his little pawn apparently like him, and he cares a lot about them, but through Kino and Nene and their actions, we get to see a lot more about 
just how genuinely good a person he is. And we already knew he had hidden depths, but we didn't really know that they went this deep. Like, the thing that got me the closest to tearing up was Kino explaining his backstory and how he came to be adopted, like, right at the beginning after the one fight. Because that that's amazing. I... Like, I was already predisposed to like Kino, because he's basically what if Finch was Boy Napon in terms of design, but he and his sister are just genuinely great characters and really pleasant to have around. They don't outstay their welcome as comedic relief, and their interactions with everyone else are good, even if the more serious stuff flies over their heads, because, well, they're young. Kino has to be extremely young if Nene is somewhere between 10 and 15. Kino is probably also in that range, but younger. Nene, mm, I'm gonna say she's younger than Rex. I'd say she's around what I expect Tora's age to be, which is around 13, and then Kino is probably like 10. And yes, it sucks that they are clones of Ryan and Sharla. It's unfortunate, especially because we're locked into having Sharla, and okay, skill trees not being there, and you being required to have Melia or Shulk in your party, that makes having someone with Sharla's kit a lot more useful. Just because you're stuck with someone with bad AI unless you're playing as Melia or Shulk and the other one isn't in your party. Now, again, this makes a healer a lot more necessary, especially with the lack of skill trees, so you can't do things like encouragement healing, crit healing, and chain attacks don't exist, so you can't do the chain attack healing stuff to do a rapid thing there. The closest thing to that is basically the Pawn Spectre heal is... Honestly, I think it's sort of comparable to using You Can Do It or Heal Round on the party. It's not like a massive overall heal, and you can't get multipliers off of that. So a healer is useful, although honestly, I played as Melia and then had Shulk and Nene as the other two characters through most of my playthrough which was on normal mode. I did not use expert mode, mostly because I expected the level scaling to be a little bit weird in this compared to the main game. I didn't know what level the final boss would be. It's probably about Zenz's level, if not a little lower, probably 80-ish. But yeah, the Fog King, I was kind of surprised that it used question mark, question mark, question mark. I mean, I was both surprised and not, because the final bosses of X and 2 did not use that. X's final boss was just straight up leveled. Ion was just straight up leveled. But, again, it was also the epilogue to Xenoblade 1, so I understand why they'd buck that and go back to question mark, question mark, question mark level. But I think that because of the new enemy icons and the way they're displayed, when I fought Zenza at, like, level 77, I think he had a yellow, like, targeting icon while his bar was still red. So... I might have been 78, 77, 78, it doesn't really matter, but I think that implies that Zenza is in fact level 82, he just has a question mark, question mark, question mark, red tag. And I did not check this on the Fog King, but I'm guessing it's around level 80 or 81. But I ended up having to level up a couple times and farm topple resist gems just to beat the Fog King when I did it. The thing is, the battle system might have been dumbed down a little bit, but overall, especially if you get pawn specters, it's not really that difficult. I died a few times, but it wasn't really more than I died in my actual playthrough of the main game, even when adjusting for the completion time. I beat it, including all the side quests and the one sort of super boss at under 12 hours, which, I mean, that means that I'm better at Xenoblade than Takahashi is, because he said he beat it in around 15, although he was probably looking around for like inconsistencies and looking for just last minute things to like hey we could spruce this up a little bit i liked the pawn specters in general like i thought they were all fun quirky characters to carry around and their side quests were all nice some of them were short some of them were long overall the side quests are a massive improvement from base game xenoblade one if that wasn't already obvious they were i'm gonna have to say tornas were as for side quest ranking, it's one is obviously the worst one. It had several extremely generic quests that were literally just kill some enemies and here's some money with zero plot or interesting characters applied to them. Then it would be two because it has some that are mostly just that and then some others that are a bit more in-depth. 
Then there was Torna's because the community chart made everything a lot more interconnected. So you were more working with a few characters that you got to know and involve and see them interact with others throughout the quests, which were good. Then I'd say FC and then X obviously has the best side quests because X, the whole game or the whole good part of the game is side quests. And while FC's aren't as good as X, which largely has to do with the main length of the game, like Torna at least had Gormot, which was almost as big as Gormot is in base Xenoblade 2. And FC is almost entirely just the shoulder. Alchemoth is the size of Alchemoth originally, and you rarely have to go there even for side quest related material. And like, I I guess the Bionis shoulder is roughly the same size as the Torn and Titan. I'm not gonna be a hundred percent on that because I don't want to be proven wrong and laughed at. But the the whole thing with Torna was you get the biggest single area with the Torn and Titan, which honestly was about the size of two Titans in the main game. And then you had Gormot, which was an edited version of a uh, Titan from previous game. It was missing the big town and it was missing the lower area and some parts of the upper, but it was like at least two thirds of Gormot was there in an edited form. Whereas we just have the Bionis shoulder, which is the biggest area. I don't know if it's bigger than the swimmable part of Eresi, but that doesn't really count. Let's be real. And then you just have Alchemoth, which it is an edited version of a previous area and it doesn't have anything blocked off, just the villa part. Well, no, it does have a little bit. It has the White Wing Palace part, I think is blocked off. Or no, are there people trapped there? I don't remember. I'm mixing that up with a post Mechanus core quest in the main game, I think. But regardless, it's almost, it's like 90% plus the original Alchemoth, but the original Alchemoth was already not very interesting. There wasn't much to explore and there aren't any NPCs there, so, like, eh. I don't mind the Bionis Shoulder. It's a fantastic area that avoids a lot of the pitfalls a lot of the areas in the actual main game do, where they have, a, like, big areas where it's just enemies. There isn't anything interesting terrain-wise. There aren't any Aether Crystal deposits, and there aren't any collectible spawns. Like... The mid and late game honestly get pretty bad with that. The Mechanis areas drag on a bit. Everyone hates Bionis interior the second time. So the shoulder is a good area. It's near the top end of quality areas in Xenoblade 1. So there's nothing really to complain about there. And just gameplay wise, yeah, it's more Xenoblade 1. It's a lot less in depth because you don't have skill trees and you don't have chain attacks. And honestly, my biggest problem with the lack of chain attacks isn't the fact that there aren't any chain attacks because a lot of the skill system of all of the revolved around that so i could see them nixing chain attacks and wanting to do something different for the epilogue if there aren't any skill trees because honestly they aren't as effective without skill trees completely boosting them my problem is you have to do a surprising percentage of the story before you can get the pawn specter union attacks because you need one Pond Spectre of each color, and you'd think that the first three you can get before you even get to Grendel the first time, you'd think that all of those would be one of each color, so you'd have all the Union Strikes available immediately, but no, you need to do a bit more story than that just in order to unlock the blue Pond Spectres, as far as I know, which is interesting. It's kind of weird, though, that... In the original game, you got your chain attacks pretty early on, and honestly, I think I had to spend more time in FC getting the Union Strikes compared to just getting the chain attacks in the main game, and that's that's not even proportional, that's just in general. It took like an hour, an hour and a half. The, the way I like to play the beginning of 1 is go through everything really quickly except quests but don't do any quests until I get Fiora at the entrance to Tefra Cave. Just rush to that point and then go back and do a bunch of the early Colony 9 stuff. So that might be a your mileage may vary thing, but it was just weird. As for the story now, which I think is honestly the most important thing, gameplay review, it's more Xenoblade 1, but it's simpler. I mean, is Torna simpler than Xenoblade 2? I don't know, because they mixed up the battle system a lot more. And here, all you have is Shulk, who doesn't even have 16 arts because there are no Mechons, so they didn't give him enchant at all. And then you have Melia, exactly the same as she was before. 
And then Kino and Nene, who are exact clones of Ryan and Charlo, who... Okay. Kino and Nene are great because it seems like they've actually been hanging around with Ryan and Charlo, and that's how they picked up their fighting style. Like, I like how they at least lampshaded the fact that they are the exact same character from gameplay's perspective. Like, Shulk straight up says, wow, it's like seeing Ryan and Charlo together again. Which sort of implies that Colony Knight has been really peaceful, which, I guess, Ryan and Charlo legitimately haven't had to fight anything if Shulk is having a nostalgic throwback to seeing people who play exactly like them. So, I'm glad they at least acknowledged it. It would have been stupid if they did. But, again, I wish we got more party members, even if they were just reskins of other characters. Like, there are two, three people who I could see joining the party, and they just don't. Even though they could easily be reskins of other characters in the game. It's mostly an unfortunate thing, and I totally understand Monolith's decision. Like, there are interviews stating, we had a limited cast because we would distract from the focus, where it's basically just Melia and her quest to retake the capital and secure a future for her people, Shulk's there as her moral support and the cool, smart engineering guy, and then Kino and Nene are there to provide more expansion on Ricky and just to do comic relief and some lighthearted stuff to balance with the really somber tone of Melia's people almost getting genocided. That's fine, but Maxis... Or Galgar, Tyrea, and Maxis could all be playable, and it wouldn't affect anything. Honestly, I, I'm going to talk about this now. Tyrea, she uses twin knives and has a mix of physical and ether abilities because she's a high entia. She could obviously be a Fiora clone. Just replace the drones with her summoning elementals like Melia does and attacking using. I guess she she just has to be locked with cannon drones and just have that be her version of element burst or mind blast or whatever easy. And then you got Galgar and Maxis. They're both high entia guards who use long swords as weapons, and Galgar ends up betraying the party at some point. And then there's a gap where there isn't really anything, and then there's Maxis, who uh, fully recommits to helping out Grandel and being a good guy at the end. You could have them share the Dunban clone role. Just give all of Galgar's stats, equipment, and EXP over to Maxis later on, and just don't have a Dunban for a little bit. You got your physical attacker, your ether attacker, a tank, and a healer. But you only got a face tank, and you only got a dedicated healer. It would be nice if you had a little bit more variety. I get why they didn't just have a Ricky clone, because they would have to be a Nopon for any of their anything to work. And you already have two Nopon. But I wouldn't mind there being one or two more Hyantia there. And I was hopeful that Tyrae was like a post-game reward or something, because there were like two quiet moments that involve her. They're some of the best quiet moments in the game, and she has a render specifically for those. But no, she doesn't get anything. I think Tyrea and Juju might be the only non-playable characters who get renders that weren't like officially shown. Juju's might have been officially shown in its full body, but like, Juju's there in the Colony 6 reconstruction menu, and Tyrae is there for two quiet moments. Which, by the way, I get now, with the lack of budget and lack of changes to the main game, why the heart-to-hearts aren't voiced, but I'm so glad the quiet moments were. Honestly, the main story of FC, it's okay. I'm gonna say it's easily the weakest Xenoblade main story, just kind of by default, by being the shortest one and not connecting to or expanding on much at all. It's shorter than Torna, it's less story arcs really than Torna, and it doesn't connect to as much as Tornet, which is fine. It's an epilogue to the main game instead of a prologue explaining character motivations for stuff that show up later in the main game. So just by definition of coming after and not having mind-blowing lore implications, it's the weakest. And that's fine because the best stuff to be found is in the quiet moments where you have a bunch of incredible Extremely heartwarming character interactions, especially the ones involving the Nopon. Kino's backstory is already great, but at some point, Nene explains that she was afraid of climbing trees, which is a reference to something Ricky says about one of his kids in the Heart to Hearts. It explains that Nene uh, was one of the Nopon present in Frontier Village. She just had a massive growth spurt in the ensuing year. And uh, Shulk, for his credit, actually genuinely feels bad about not recognizing her, which means... Oh wait, I just realized, that's character development for Shulk. He recognizes when he do does something 
that might come off as socially awkward and understands it this time. It's actually amazing compared to how he is in the main game where, I mean, let's be real, Shulk is not written to be the most neurotypical crayon in the box, which that's great. I am not neurotypical and I can relate to Shulk in a lot of respects, but it's also cool to just see progression in that regard as I like it. It's awesome. Nene just gets a bunch of heartwarming moments just showing how surprisingly mature she is for her age and I don't know where else to say this but Kino and Nene get very small amounts of concept art in the art book. It's mostly revolving around new outfits for the old characters and stuff that was in the Monado secret files but was never shown to western audiences officially in book form and there's some new stuff that wasn't shown off there, but that's honestly the minimum, or the, the smaller part. Kino and Nene get like two pages each. Pyrea doesn't even get a future connected section because she keeps her old design. I I wish she had pants, honestly. Like, yeah, there are some stupid female designs in all the Xeno games. And like, Tyrea's isn't even the worst high endia. But I just wish she had pants. It just looks kind of dumb if you realize that she doesn't. But for some reason, Kino and Nene, they have very limited equipment. Shulk and Melia have the advantage of already having stuff from the main game to use, so their equipment looks, has a, a lot more visual variety. They have the new FC outfits and they get like three recolors of each of those. And Kino and Nene only have the one outfit with three different colorations and then three skins or three different weapon models so that's whatever they did the bare minimum for a lot of reasons when it comes to that but it is i guess important noting that nene is like the only significant napan character who doesn't have a mark on her stomach kino has the three claw marks which you could see because he's wearing a ricky style vest but nene if you just take her armor off she has a bare stomach which is weird because there's concept art of her with the marking but also for some reason the only xenoblade 2 material in the art book there are some torah outfit concepts with nene and one of them is torah in a thong which i didn't need to see that you didn't need to see that they intentionally put stuff from the wrong game in this book just to scar people and i mean they did a good job at it but that won't prevent me from being mad anyway the one big story takeaway that wasn't like meta xeno lore related that I really cared about from Future Connected was I needed to see Melia or Tyrea referred to the other one as sister. And we got that in one of the quiet moments, the two Tyrea ones that really cap off the story and explain a bit better why Tyrea is doing what she does in the ending cutscene of the game were really fantastic. They're a great closure. I mean, Melia was like always my favorite in Xenoblade 1, but like Tyrea is, is, pretty high up there now uh, i'm gonna say but actual story content it's fine like it's not bad it's still well above the average for jrpgs it's just not as wide in scope and as earth shattering in what happens as you would expect from xenoblade but again it's basically like one or two chapters of xenoblade one and it just happens to be the ones with less conflict. It's not near Mechanis Core, Prison Island, or Space Memory. It's like mid-game chapters. It's the... Honestly, the closest thing I could compare it to would be the Frontier Village arc. You meet some Napan, you go to a town, you find out it has trouble, you fix the trouble, everything's good, and everyone moves on with their life. And that's fine. Doesn't have to be major. It's a nice little thing to cap off the end of Xenoblade 1. It's just connected in the title gave me way too high expectations. Am I disappointed by it? I mean, kind of, because they put connected in the title and they had a rift. That's enough to make me hyped because that makes me think there's going to be multiverse stuff. There wasn't though, and it's fine. It's less standalone than Torna was. Don't bother playing this if you haven't already finished Xenoblade 1 at least once, honestly. But, just in general, the story. It's fine. 
I mean, I'm going to say that probably a bunch more times than this, but I enjoyed the new characters they added. It was really nice seeing Teal'in expanded from an NPC, and they made his side quest not only canon, but actually important to the plot. The idea that half Entia might not be the only ones remaining is actually really interesting, and it's really sad the fact that Teal'in is still working to potentially turn the transformed full Entia back from Telethia. And there are a lot of... If, if we're saying that post-core side quests are canon now, there are a bunch of side quests that involve going into Alchemoth and killing Telethia of other named NPCs that we interacted with and did side quests for to put them out of their misery. What if it was possible to turn Telethia back? Imagine the guilt everyone in the party would feel and the people who gave those quests who seem to be still alive and back in Colony 9 if the Affinity Chart has anything to say. What would they feel if they acted too soon and said, put these, put my friend, put my lover, put my family member out of their misery because there is no going back. They're Telethia now. They're no longer themselves. What would those people feel if Teelan and Tyrea succeeded in finding a way to bring the High Antia back? That's a big existential dread question that isn't even stated at all in the game, but if you did enough side quests to know who Teelan is, then you probably did enough side quests to think about that too. And then there's the whole High Entia Machina conflict thing, which, eh? Like, I completely understand the, there just being racial tensions in Grandel in general. And I also understand why High Entia, who themselves are even the ones, even the half Entia, the ones who had been discriminated against for being biracial, I get what, how they would basically just inherit the general culture of the High Entia of being high and mighty and kind of looking down at everyone else. I get how they get that, even if they were discriminated against themselves for being part non Entia. And I understand them not trusting the Machina because they know that the Machina built the Mechon. And I would understand people from the Bionic Shoulder, especially. Anyone who is in Colony 9 and anyone who met Ahams from the Fallen Arm would totally understand that anything the Machina did against Bionis was basically just a product of Egil's misguided egil ing and that the other Machina were basically just as oppressed under him as the Hams and the Napon were. I get that, but these guys, they were from Alchemoth, or apparently they were refugees from the Collapse of the Titans, which is interesting because... These Homs NPCs are Homs we've never seen before. So that means that they must have been from other colonies. That makes sense. We know that only a few colonies are left, and 6 and 9, nice, are the only ones in contact with each other by the time the game starts. But that doesn't mean that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, or 11. I think there are around 11, so I'm just going to assume that was the amount that those are just still out there, or that there were some survivors just kind of living out in the wild, and they found their way to the Bionis shoulder after the collapse of Bionis. So, I get that. Anyone who wasn't from Colony 6 or 9, or ended up there after events in the story, would have reason to distrust the Machina. And I also get Radzim's point of view completely. He's saying, I know your capital is there, but you're just going to get more people killed if you try to reclaim it. Because he's a Machina. They live for a long time. He was probably there for the battle against the Titans. He was probably there for having to flee Agniratha. He might have been a child, but he would probably have his own memory in his own lifetime of something very, very similar happen. And he just didn't want to see another people go through the same thing he did. And then I also really liked... Melia's thing that she says at some point where hi Entia we can still see our home it's still there it's a tangible thing that we can look at and work for but everyone else their home just has been destroyed it is gone there are no traces of it left Mechanus is completely gone and everything left of Bionis besides Colony 9 is sunk into the new salty ocean down there 
everything they had they've lost and they're just happy that they're still alive so the high entia are honestly privileged in a way where they have a chance of reclaiming their home and everyone else just doesn't and then there's just the whole everyone in grandel it's basically a colony six situation it's people who normally wouldn't understand each other or be enemies outright mostly through understanding having to come together and do things work in harmony and use uh work to the strengths of each race's own talents abilities and culture in order to better come it, it's a microcosm of xenoblade x basically and also a microcosm of why diversity is important in the real world is just more people with more perspectives and different experiences when they work together a lot more good can be done than just an echo chamber of people who are all the same and it, it's an important I, I it is important that like the only person who is like actively a hateful racist is galgar and we're gonna get to him whereas the rest of the companions were just like kind of annoyed at being told that their efforts as noble imperial knights are in vain and they kind of resent as the Homs resent the High Entia for not participating in the Battle of Sword Valley, the High Entia resent the Machina for not helping out in previous conflicts against the Mechon. They say betrayal, which I guess sort of goes back to the original battle, like when the Giants and High Entia were around and there were no Homs. But I guess they also view their somewhat inaction in the previous Battle of Sword Valley as doing something wrong. I'm not really sure. But the point is that they were always second-guessing it. Maxis might have been the one in charge and the one giving the orders, but there were other NPCs who were like, I, I don't feel right. I can't stop thinking about the people back in Grandel and hoping they're fine. And Maxis has a change of heart and comes through when needs arise, And but he and Radzim, they're, they're fine at the end. It's basically like the political leader, or the, I guess he's the mayor, uh, of Grandel, and then the military leader, at least for the High Entia Regiment, I would assume Homs have some of their own thing in there. It doesn't seem like there are any battle-ready Nopon there, because I guess the majority of them would be from Alchemoth, so they wouldn't be used to that kind of thing. Also, all the side quests tying back to Bana is just amazing. I'm glad that he's still there, he still has, has his tragic decision as his battle theme, and it's amazing that he changed his name to Bama, and that was his idea of a disguise. It would have been slightly better if he had, like, Groucho glasses or something on, or, like, a fake mustache or something, but I'll take what I can get. And that was all nice and good. But moving on to Galgar. People were annoyed, apparently, at how obvious he ended up being the villain. But the thing is, Galgar being a shithead isn't a plot twist. When it's pretty obvious he's a racist asshole when you first meet him his first cutscene shows him obviously being a shitty person <laughs> like dixon actually being a villain is a plot twist because while there were hints for it throughout the game beforehand he wasn't introduced as obviously an antagonist mumkar was there for that and he was a trusted friend of everyone in colony nine and a father figure to shulk at the beginning so that actually comes out as a surprise when Galgar immediately acts against the Machina and against the pureblood High Antia, <laughs> you can tell he's a villain. The trailers didn't make any sort of distinction that he wasn't a villain. You, you saw him from a low angle walking with a sword with flames in the background initially. Like, you could tell he wasn't a good person. And I'm okay with him being a cartoonishly evil person because he's albedo. He's the Xenoblade 1 version of Albedo, who is basically an extremely powerful person who, as a result of a lot of psychological abuse, also ended up being completely insane and torments the main characters connected to him that way. Galgar, because he hates all pure blood High Antia with a passion just for existing, he must have been on the receiving end of tons of abuse for being a half-entia, and he was a member of the Royal Guard, which 
Sure, there are tons of half entia in the Companions, but it's very likely that the, the Royal Guard, we are the true protectors of the Imperial line, as His Majesty Saurian Antiqua is a pure-blood High Entia, as is everyone in the Imperial line from now until the end of time, we will... It, it seems like people who would be put in the Imperial Guard would frequently be the high and mighty pure-blood supremacist type, so I could easily see Galgar being on the receiving end of tons of abuse for his entire life, and that basically informing his worldview to think that all purebloods are evil. I, I get where he's coming from, but again, like Egil, killing everyone is not the solution. And he he's just, he just is insane. He somehow came to the conclusion that Zanza and the Bionis are not the people that we should worship with all our zealotry, but Melia herself as the savior of the Half-Blood Hyantia, leading them into a new future as he basically wants to turn Melia into a goddess and Melia barely even wants to be a princess. It takes a bit of time in the shoulder for her even to realize that she should become the symbol of hope for the High Entia. And he, him being an insane villain is fine because I got to see someone who looks and acts like Albedo being insane again, and that's all I can really ask for. Kalyan already looks a lot more like him just design-wise in his DE redesign, but Galgar also looks quite a lot like him, and he also has the insanity and the being a villain part, so... Yeah. In the end, he's just a pitiable guy who is not in his right mind anymore. And it is kind of unfortunate that he got his end in a side quest once he was stopped, or I mean he succeeded in his plan, but Melia being cool. And once he was stopped and decided to stop being a threat, he got relegated to a side quest villain, and he gets his comeuppance there. And yeah, that's kind of unfortunate, but like, he's a half Entia who jumped off into the clouds. Tyrea does her flying away thing again in a quiet moment. He doesn't have to be dead. He can very easily come back. He could have found more racist people just among other high Entia or among the Homs and Napon. I could see him easily going against an anti-Machina role because there are clearly people who would still hold resentment against people of Makanis and come back with the force to cause trouble in some later game. That's fine. He could easily do that. He's insane. He could have just been doing that for theatrics to make Melia think he was dead or something. They could very easily bring him back. That death was not conclusive. Although I do think it's funny that with all the non-existent Xenoblade 2 connections that the main game made, like, it didn't change anything to better reflect 2 other than drilling it even further in that Elvis is Ontos. After all that, we ended up running around an island in a sea of clouds. I also thought it was cool. The there There's more X in Future Connected than there is 2, in all honesty. And one of the best things is just the intro cutscene to Bionis Shoulder. It's a lot more like the intro to Primordia in X than it is the Gower Plane or Gormont one in 2. And I also just, uh, the, the Telethia flying by junks, which they start calling the junks in any new DE material, which is, is just kind of funny, but whatever. And the Telethia flying by is very reminiscent of a large flying creature that goes past Cross and Elma when X has its scene like this. And then it's a really subtle thing, but I really, really liked the thing where it showed by on a shoulder when like the little this is where you are here indicator normally it just shows yep this is where you are in the titan but it actually showed the bionis shattering and the remains in the ocean with the shoulder hovering above it I, I just thought that was a really nice touch and i think it's cool it explained the hovering reefs in Earth sea they were made from floatstone mined from the shoulder which is just made out of a levitating material alchemoth was presumably made of that stuff too NPCs and a couple cutscenes, I think, say that Alchemoth was straight up moved, which is a little weird. I just assumed that it hung where it was and the Bionis collapsed underneath it. So, whatever. One of the Seal Islands made it there too, though, so what do I know? And, let's see. In terms of cutscene choreography, few combat stuff, but what was there was great. It was interesting seeing Nene being a straight up club user. Ricky rarely got to actually fight in cutscenes, so it was cool seeing someone do something like that. 
And then Kino is just pleasant to have around in general. You get to see Shulk doing a lot more acrobatics, which he's capable of doing that. That's not the power of the Monado. I'll get to that. Uh, I'm... The rest of this video is just going to be the... These are possibly references to other Xeno things. And Shulk, you saw him when he first came back with a replica Monado and how he could still do crazy acrobatic stuff with a replica. And he carries this on too. And then Melia, oh my god, they finally showed Melia using her elementals. She literally just used Mind Blast and Burst End in cutscenes in the original game. But wow, they actually remembered her real gimmick, which is cool. I thought it was a little weird that she seemed to default to Summon Flare for her attacks when I think Summon Bolt's a bit better for that, but whatever. And there was also the even better touch of when she rushed into the Flaming Building, she summoned Aqua a bunch of times. Although, I think she summons more than three elementals a couple times, which... That would have been a neat thing you could have done in order to separate FC a bit more from the main game, but... You know, what are you gonna do? So, let's just go into the actual references section. The Fog King is an Infernal Goldo. That's the model he uses. And then the Rifts... They've got to either connect to another universe, connect to the Zohar... They seem... they're not really like the Klaus body rift or like the wormholes Rex is able to make. They're kind of close. They don't connect to something in the same universe. I can guarantee you that. It might just be the Zohar itself shooting energy out. It might be like the space between universes where some souls were flung and the Fog King is just some sort of soul of a human from another world. I mean, I think it's funny that Maynith refers to Mary Magdalene as a Homs and not a human in Project Cross Zone, so it could be something like that. I mean, Homs basically are just humans, but they do have fantasy powers a little bit, so it could be something related to that. I don't think the Fog King is Galea, because the Infer it, it could be the Infernal Galdo got split up like Klaus did, and this is just the Xenoblade one half of it. That makes more sense. The Infernal Goldo could be Galea based on the 1ID tag. I just don't think it is. I think if Galea has another half, they'd be saving that for a different game. As opposed to just having her unceremoniously destroyed a couple times across universes. It just seems anticlimactic. I don't know. I'd be okay with her just being Maynith, and then once Maynith died, then that was it. But I don't want her to be wasted just as a one-off boss, either, if that makes any sense. The Fog King also bears resemblance to a couple things. First off, the ghost enemy faction from X. And second off, the Fog King's a freaking Gnosis. I shouldn't even bother pretending that that isn't what it's supposed to be. It's an intangible being that can't be hurt by any sort of conventional weaponry, including stuff that's extremely powerful and capable of destroying much more physically threatening non-Gnosis things. Let's be real. It's a Gnosis. The way it corrupts things is more similar to the Tainted Virus in X, so it's a Gnosis that can do the Tainted stuff. I mean, we don't really know where the Tainted came from, so it could be from a Gnosis-like entity. And then, there's Shulk fighting it. Alright, it can't be hit, but we... I I'm gonna cut through the bullshit again, because... Shulk invents the goddamn Hilbert effect in this. Like, I was heartwarmed a ton by a lot of the character interactions. I was hyped when Unfinished Battle played and actually looped again. I did not want Tyrea to commit suicide by monster, because she managed to endear herself to me far more than she did before, and came away as one of my favorite characters and one I would love to see more of in the future. So that was a great moment. Like, honestly, Tyrea's being... No, when I die, run like hell. I know I'm more powerful than all of you, so I'm capable of buying more time, and if I do this, less lives will be lost. That was a great moment. And Tyrea, just, it, it, she's a great character. I'm going to keep saying that. But the hype moment, the thing that got my theorist brain tingling the most, was... Okay, these enemies cannot be hit with any of our conventional weaponry. Let's invent some sort of field that can be projected out from a weapon 
that allows us to now hit it using conventional weaponry. I know it's basically a Monado enchant for the Fog King, and thank God they didn't give Shulk enchant back and make him have to use that in the battle in order to hit it, because that would be really, really awful. But sure, it is effectively Monado enchant. I think the animation he uses is even the enchant animation from another cutscene, but it's the goddamn Hilbert effect. This is going to become a running gag with me saying that something's a Hilbert effect. I know it is, but this is actually the goddamn Hilbert effect because he used it to fight an enemy. This is basically a big gnosis. And I, I think that's really cool, honestly. And then there's the rift thing because there, there are instances of Telethia acting like they still have their original high Entia brain, which is fine. That's not a big deal because we knew that was a thing from the main game already. It wasn't just Kallion being able to potentially control his transformation and still communicate. There were tons of side quests talking about Telethia protecting places or people that they were close to in the past, in their previous lives. So, Teelan's mother coming and rescuing him from Galgar, that has precedent. The other Telethia protecting Alchemoth, that has precedent. Telethia trying to stop the Fog King, which is a danger to the remainder of the High Entia, that has precedent. I don't have a problem with that. But then we have Telethia going into the Rift. This is where the Telethia in the X universe came from. It doesn't specify, it doesn't have to be that, oh, one of those Telethia eventually grew into Endbringer. They could just be the progenitors of Telethia. We know, according to bestiary entries, that there are multiple of them in the X universe, so. They're an entire species, but that's where they came from. This could also be the origin of the Tainted, just a multiversal corrosive thing that takes over the minds and bodies of beasts and is capable of controlling them. So, that is just genuinely really cool. The connections are bigger to X. I also like the idea that Shulk says the Fog King is potentially a weird quirk of the world being new, which... I mean, Shulk wouldn't know any better, but that would technically put one nail in the coffin of Alvis made a new universe or shunted them into a different universe as opposed to putting them back on the Earth from Xenoblade 2. But again, Shulk does not know any better. So he wouldn't know either way. So this isn't a confirmation in any direction. It's just a potential thing. But Shulk theorizing that, oh, this is because the universe isn't stable yet. This sort of lends credence to the theory that Galdos are just kind of a thing that happens when Zohar power goes awry and infects people, but this Galdo just happened to come from a different universe than Shulk's, or than the Xenoblade 1 universe, both the old one and the new, and it was just lurking from some interdimensional thing that might still have the Zohar based on the strength of the Fog King beams, and the fact that they're very similar to Siren lasers as well, so... That makes sense. The destination that Telethia find themselves on on the other side of the rift doesn't even have to be the same universe that the Fog King and the Blasts came from, even. Telethia being multiverse walkers and just happen happening to originate from Xenoblade 1, that works too. Napon are universal constant in any universe except Xenosaga and Xenogears, which, let's be real, we have confirmation of a Xenoblade multiverse. We have confirmation that there's a Xenosaga multiverse from Xenosaga. So, like, you just put the other Xeno games in other places in these multiverses that already exist, and boom, they're the same multiverse, actually. Wahoo. It's not, not really a big deal. Like, you got the Wave Existence going to his higher domain. You got Udu from a higher domain. You got both Alvis and Architect Klaus implying that higher powers beyond themselves in the Zohar exist. So, like, actual god... Or an Udu type being is completely possible and could totally exist. It could just be a different wave existence from the ones we saw from Gears and Saga. That would make perfect sense. Wahoo, yippity dingle do. So, X connections. This might have explained the Tainted. This might have explained Telethia the Endbringer. It does not explain the Samarians. But I could easily see a distant sequel to Xenoblade 1 having a Hyantia or Homs make spaceship just kind of going through. 
go, go through that rift, see what's on the other side. And just populated by brave people, hopefully not any characters we know, because we don't know where they'll end up. And they end up being the Samarians, or something stupid like that. Honestly, the thing the Samarians most remind me of is the immigrant fleet from Xenosaga, so I honestly wouldn't be surprised if when Ormus was in possession of the Zohar, one of the many times it was, that an entire segment of immigrant fleet just kind of got flung into the beginning of a different universe at some point, and that just kind of happened, and that's where the Samarians came from, and that's the connection. Like, that, that you can have that theory for free. It's not really a big one, but it certainly exists. So, yeah. X connection's the biggest one. Potentially not on the same planet as two. I kind of want to see Elma dual wielding Rex and Shulk swords at some point. Oh, I forgot about the one big two connection because I'm a dumbass. Shulk's new replica Monado is called the Monado Rex because of course it is. And that leads to the crackpot theory that Xenoblade 2 challenge mode is actually canon. And the Shulk and Fiora were just drawn and brought back in time from basically from the one year between the end of Xenoblade 1 and the start of Future Connected, where Shulk and Fiora were dragged from their universe by the Arc Sage, brought across space into the Land of Challenge, which ex exists in between spaces, and is actually mostly the same in Definitive Edition. It uses Xenoblade 1 or DE assets for the most part, but it still does have the background of the Cloud Sea, which is kind of cool. So, that they were they were brought back. Shulk met Rex and saw Pyra's sword, and that's what inspired the design of the Monado Rex, because it, it has the four ether jets. So, you know, there's that. The blade is even depicted as being slightly greener than it is in a lot of the other games, which I think is kind of funny. And then the other form is just the, the Hilbert Effect version. Hilbert Effect equipped version is just the Monado Rex Plus but I like that. It wasn't a direct lore connection. It was a dumb, stupid Easter egg that I couldn't help but laugh at, where Shulk's new Monado looks more like Rex's Aegis Sword, and it's called the Monado Rex, so that's pretty funny. So, lastly, I just kind of want to talk about the ending, and it's not really underwhelming. It's just capping off this epilogue. It's Alchemoth being rebuilt. We get to see the rest of the Xenoblade 1 characters we come to know and love. Not in speaking roles, but we see everyone's still there. Fiora, Ryan, Dunban, Sharla, Ricky, Atharon, Vanea, Juju. They're all there. They all take junks to the shoulder and they all help repair Alchemoth for everyone. And that's really nice. I also thought it was a nice touch that Melia stayed on the shoulder and Shulk and the Nopon went back on their own. I also did think it was kind of funny. Like, I get Shulk. He likes machines enough where I could totally see him learning how to operate junks on his own. But I was always under the impression that it took multiple people to fly. Like, there were a bunch of Machina technicians there. They might have been there just to oversee me call, too. But I, I always thought you needed multiple people to pilot it. Shulk might just be really good, or he just reconfigured it in order to, like, pilot better or use less people to pilot. Basically, what I'm saying is Junks is more of an ES Ruben than an ES Dina, Asher, or Levy. No, not, not Levy. Dina, Asher, and Zebulon are the party ones that have two people. Uh, I'm getting way off topic. But it was it was nice seeing that. The sad thing is Melia's is probably going to stay in Alchemoth now. So if we start following people back in Colony 9, she probably won't be there. And if anything, we're going to get like Tyrea or Maxis as our high anti reps. Which, I mean, Maxis is an okay character if a little one-dimensional. No, he's 2D. He's 2D. He has his whole guilt thing, so that, that's enough to make him separate. Tyrea is amazing, and... Okay, so you got Melia becoming the Empress. She is of the light and the new beacon, the hope of the High Antia, while Tyrea is there standing in her shadow. She was also a candidate for the throne, but thought Melia was better off at it, and is basically going to be the one working in the shadows, doing not necessarily dirty work, but... Stuff that Melia doesn't need to do, supporting in her own way while staying out of the public eye. So, my question is, I could either make a, she is the Sasuke to Melia's Naruto, or she is the Hubert to Melia's Edelgard. And I'm not sure which is worse, so just pretend I said whichever one makes you more irrationally mad that I said it at all. Because they're both kind of, kind of awful.
And I just like the Melia, it ends with Melia going out to address her people again like she did back in the main game when she was first confirmed as heir. It's basically her story arc coming full circle. She is the hope of the High Entia. And the thing is, if you want to go into a future where children and grandchildren are of the party members are still around, like say Nene's an old lady, but Shulk through Ricky are dead. Melly is still going to be alive and she's still going to be in like her 30s equivalent. So you could have to go really far in the future for Melia to go down in history as a person of legend. And now that she's the ruler of Alchemoth, she's still going to be a prominent figure. So you're not going to have one cool moment when I first saw FC was me thinking of like way off in the future, like something 500 years after Future Connected where most people are dead. Machina probably keeping to themselves and that's the justification for them uh, for people who knew the past heroes not being involved in the plot. And you have someone who is just very, who has whitish blonde hair basically and maybe well, darker skin than any other High Antia because my, my headcanon is that uh, lighter skinned Homs lived higher up on the Bionis and darker skinned Homs were more native to lower areas in the Bionis' body, and that's why Hyentia are much lighter skinned than Homs for the most part, even though a lot of, like, Homs, they run the gamut. They, there are Homs that could be representative of, like, every major ethnicity in the world. They come in all colors, but Hyentia, despite a lot of them being part Homs, are mostly really, really pale. So my guess would just be that they only interbred with lighter skinned Homs and that they came from higher up on the way honest. But anyway, so say that this person obviously has a small bit of high antia blood, but like it, it's not a lot because they're far darker than any high antia. They don't have visible wings and their hair is only partially whitish or something. And they have some ether talents, but not a lot. And as part of their quest to try and understand the world or save it from whatever this new threat is, they run into a really old ruin and there's only a few extremely old, uh, more pure blood Hyantia living there. And one of them is an extremely old Melia being like, oh, would you like to hear the story of Shulk, the Monado, of the Hero Pond, and of the Hyantia of old? That was a scene that I kind of pictured, but if Melia is going to basically continue the succession of the line of Antiqua and sort of start her own thing, basically. She's going to go down in legend and she's going to be around for other centuries as a prominent figure. So that's probably not going to happen unless they go way far in the future. But I would rather have a 30 to 40 year old Shulk meet up with a 20 to 30 year old Rex and like Shion and Faye in their 20s and 30s, maybe like an older Lynn after getting her body back somehow. So she's in her 20s or 30s, like, she could be the youngest one still. She could be, like, 18 to 20-something. And then have them meet up with a new protagonist and save the world from whatever stupid shit the Zohar has been wrangled up in this time. I'd be okay with that. I'd, I I want my Xeno crossover. That's the thing. I want my Xeno crossover far more than I want something in the distant future of the Xenoblade 1 world. So I guess Melia is going to stay a teenager early 20s for the foreseeable future because... I don't mind stories going past the time when Shulk and Friends are dead and Melia is the only one left, but I just want Shulk and Friends to cross over with Rex and Friends and Elma and Friends and Shion and Friends and Faye and Friends long before I want to see something like that. So, yeah. All in all, it's the worst Xenoblade. But that's not really a bad thing because it was never trying to be anything more than a couple more chapters on the story of Xenoblade 1. And that's fine. And until next time, this is Luxem, signing off.